we're, we are going to do class. One of the things uh, that we're going to do is we're going to do some introductions and some other pieces because we've, we've got more people together than we've had in a long time. And I, one of the things that I have always hated is when I know someone and I knew their name at one point and then my, my brain dislodges that information and I feel embarrassed about it later. So in an obligatory way where I make us all do it, we're going to say our names to each other later on. But first and foremost, the new one to the party is Nora. And so here is Nora. Nora, you can wave to everybody and then wave to the people in the room. Uh, and we'll, we'll do names twice. We're going to do it right now. We're just going to do a lightning round of say your name. And then we'll do it again later. And we'll do like say your name and favorite ice cream like later on in the, in the class. But uh, yeah, a nice little icebreaker just because we're back to where other humans are again a little bit more and more all the time. Um, but Jamie, would you start us off with what's your name? And then, we, and I'm Corey, I'm Corey Rice, that's me. Um, and so we're gonna go through today and just do our class. I'm gonna buzz through what I have prepared relatively quickly because Nora, who is much better at all the biolab things than I am has prepared uh, a good explanation of what we're up to. And so she's gonna talk for as much time as I can carve out for her for 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is that she would need. And then we'll do a quick, quick lightning round show and tell because the people who are physically here in the space, we can actually go ahead and get started with the lab that's going on. So the goal is to try and get to that, uh, to not dally too long on slides because we'd like to let you use the time of class to get some of the work done. Because uh, there's some incubation and waiting periods and some of those things that are worth it to try and get to happen in here. So without much further ado, here we go with the bio lab. So we're going to go over just a, a handful of things. These are some slides. The, these are the slides that I put together for us. We're going to try and cover microbiology and biochemistry in like four slides as fast as you possibly can. This is like four years worth of undergrad study. So do, do not think that there's any way that you're going to fully understand it in four slides, but we're going to try and like summarize it broad strokes. Then we're going to update you on micro pipettes just because they're a, a clever little device. Um, and then we'll talk about PCR, which is a really interesting topic, given that if you've gotten a COVID test, it was probably it could have been a PCR test. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about gel electrophoresis and sort of the steps that go in there and then bio leather and bioplastics, which is like another adjacent thing you could do in the bio lab that's actually fascinating. Uh, well, God has been up to it and there's some really interesting things that they're doing in Barcelona and they do blog posts with like full sets of instructions that are really cool because you can then just follow them. And then there's more. So uh, that said, we're gonna try and do this. So here's a microbiology. That's not how you capitalize it, but it just to draw in that this is the small version of biology. Zoology is for like big animals and zebras and, and those sorts of things. But microbiology is when you're talking about the small world. And so on top, that's an animal cell. On the bottom, that's a plant cell. And this may feel like it's an other, but it's very much a part of you. Increasingly over the past like five, 10 years, we've started to understand the microbiome. And microbiology is an integral part of how you work also. So it's interesting to think about it in all realms, uh, just to sort of see what that is. But basically, this is the part of biology in high school where you were taught about mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell, that the nucleus is where the DNA is, that there's a cell wall on a plant, there's a cell membrane on both, uh, and some of those, those pieces and parts. Then there's biochemistry, which is a really fun one. Uh, up in the top right, that is adenosine triphosphate, ATP, just like the power exchange for a cell. And then this is really like chemistry, but the turns out that cells are small enough that the actual chemistry starts to matter. Like the geometry of the chemicals makes a big difference for a thing that's as small as a cell. And so the way that the atoms all sit relative to each other can actually build like little tiny mechanisms in a very literal, not allegorical sense, you get mechanisms when you have groups of atoms on this size and scale. I sent out some videos through Slack that were, that were just like animations of those things happening. You can find videos of like little walking uh, proteins that'll move along parts of a cell. You can watch mechanisms play. Uh, there's like a spinning motor pump that makes ATP in the cell, which is fascinating to watch. 
It's very mechanical, but in a collection of a few hundred or a few thousand atoms, right? And you're talking about mechanisms like we might think of an internal combustion engine, but on the scale of just a few atoms or just a hundred atoms, which is kind of mind blowing that life exists on that, on that level. Uh, protein modeling is fascinating. If you haven't ever played the game Fold It, which is a weird game, if you wanna Google it right now, Fold It um, is a game where you can help practice protein modeling. Uh, I'll put it in Slack, but it's a game where you, you play, the, play with the metrics of folding and spinning proteins, making protein sheets, these little helical spirals, and all of those sorts of things. This is a huge part of how life works. The like major players in biochemistry are the Krebs cycle, the Calvin cycle and photosynthesis, sort of like cellular respiration, how you take in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide and how plants do the exact opposite. Those are, I had an entire semester long class in college, basically just about those three cycles. That was it. Um, and and that's, that may be your experience. There's a lot of depth that you can go into here, but there's a lot of fascinating ways to understand these things also. Now, if we wanted to try and get microbiology, thinking that there's, there's microbiology and there's also then biochemistry, we're gonna try and put it into just four slides. First up, and this was a big deal uh, several hundred years ago, life is made up of cells. We didn't know that for a long time. Uh, the last time a pandemic came around, that was, you know, people, people knew that life was made up of cells, but back when the bubonic plague was around, that was not true. We didn't know it then. Uh, we didn't, there were several things that were, that were different. But basically cells follow DNA instructions. And so your, it may have, you probably know many of the things that I'm gonna ex explain now, but they, these instructions are largely a shared language of all of life around the world. Down the right, I've got a list of percentages for what percent of your DNA is shared with different organisms. And so you can see that human, it's 99.9, .9. chimpanzee, uh, it's 98.8. .8. You keep going down the list. It's kind of wild to see what those numbers are for different things, that you share 45% of your DNA with cabbage. Who would have thought, right? Like, it's kind of amazing to watch that code get played out. And it's very much just a series of instructions, like the code that you write for a computer. But instead of a binary system, it's a quaternary system. And it works in a different way. It helps fold proteins that are sort of like self assembly or assembled machines from those encoded pieces of information, which is fascinating. Also, there's this phylogenetic tree that you can look at up in the top, where animals are off on the right, fungi, which are closer to us than animals, and then plants a little bit further to the left. Those all fit in the eukaryotes. Those are things with cells in them, with cell nuclei in them. And then you've got bacteria and archaea that are further distant relations, but you can sort of map out when you code everyone's DNA, all the different organisms, you can look at how things are related, which is fascinating. That all of this is traceable in very much like a paper trail sort of way, when you look at all of the DNA and, and how it came together. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing sort of story that you can pull out when you have all this information to decode. Also, 60% of your DNA is the same as a banana. That is wild. <laughs> uh, the parts of a cell. This is a good, like, perhaps you, you've had this experience also. It's a perennial favorite to make a jello cell in like high school biology, where you make a jello, you, you like make a nine by 13 of jello, and you stick in it a bunch of weird objects that are meant to represent the different parts of a cell. Maybe, maybe you've done that. Maybe some, some sad science teacher subjected you to that. Uh, I am proud of them as a colleague and sad for you, the student. But it is a fascinating little activity where you start to imagine like all these little pieces and parts that each has a job. That the nucleus is where all that DNA lives. It stays inside there. That you've got the, you know, the, the mitochondria where lots of your, the sugars that you take in get converted into ATP and other things happen. You've got Golgi apparatus. You've got the, uh, the there's like different sections that each have their own job. And we could, we could go with this for a long time to try and understand all of these different pieces and parts. These may feel like vague memories at first, uh, and you're not going to necessarily jump into the bio space and be manipulating all of these things, but it's good to remember some of these words. There's a large part of this week's class that's just like making sure that you've seen these words again. Not, not so much that we're trying to even really cover it and understand them all, but just that they exist out there. That hopping in and knowing that, that, these, that these are all pieces and parts.
like the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, those are words that you probably don't talk about in regular conversation at home, uh, but it's interesting to see sort of how they fit when you're looking them, when you're looking at a cell on the scale. Now, DNA and RNA are interesting. This is more uh, a relevant piece just because of where we're at. I pulled over here, we're thinking about DNA because we're gonna run some gel electrophoresis later on. The, the big thing is that you're able to look at and manipulate this molecule. It's two nanometers across and a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So three and a third feet is a meter. One one billionth of that, two, two one billionths of a meter is the width of a DNA molecule. But in each cell, if it's that wide, it's also about six feet long. So when you string that all out into one continuous string and you've got that rolled up in every one of your hundred trillion cells inside your body. So we're gonna get access to some of those today and, and actually be taking a look at them. Now, not everything has that much DNA. Uh, this is take, taken directly from the New York Times. That's the coronavirus genome up there on the top right. And then the bottom right is the B117 variant, the variant that right now is, is giving schools a rough time. And you can see they've mapped out where all of the different changes, the, the mutations exist. And most of them you'll see are in the spike protein. So what it does is it takes the spike protein from looking kind of like an exclamation point to looking more like a triangle. And in so doing, it seems like it connects better to humans, which is not good. I'm not saying that that's a good thing. Uh, it's just that it's interesting that a few little changes in the code can adapt the shape and effectiveness of how this particular virus that we're all right now poignantly aware of it works, works with or against us. Um, also worth mentioning is that DNA is what we, we're gonna talk about mostly, but RNA is another part of you and how that information gets stored and transferred. Uh, but in some organisms like in viruses, it's often the only information they have. It's a much older way to record this information. It probably came about first and then DNA was more of a redundancy and like st stability of information technique. Um, but it's interesting to see that these, these procedures exist and that they're, they're all put together there. There's a really fascinating story about how we came to understand, uh, a, a real fascinating human story about how we came to understand the structure of DNA that I would encourage you to go at further with like a whole bunch of drama between scientists and all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, lots of drama. In, in here, one of the interesting things, and this is if you're really getting advanced with our biospace, you can actually change that code uh, that makes things run a little bit. And you've gotta be, this is something that we need to be a bit careful with, but it is complicated, but there's interesting things that are happening. They talk about, there's some talk about developing bacteria that might eat plastics or that might do other things. And we're starting to learn how to tinker with this. I just saw an article last week about the first synthetic, completely synthetic life was created, which is fascinating. It self-replicates synthetic life. Like it was, it was designed and built, little cells that self-replicate instead of a naturally found one. I don't quite know what that means. I tried to read the article and it didn't all make sense, um, but it is, it's fascinating to see how this works. I've got a thousand follow-up questions. It does, like it's it's a it's not like a cat, right? It's it's just a little cell, so it's it's fascinating. Um, but in any case, you've got all of these genomes in complexity, where this is sort of the average length of a genetic code, and some things have more genetic code, some have less. But in order to really be able to have the the complexity to be, whoop, to be alive, you've got to have enough genetic code and be able to do a few things. One of those is reproduce on your own. Viruses can't, but viruses have taught us a neat trick. They can inject genetic code into bacteria or into you in, our, in the case of coronavirus, and then sort of take over a cell and make it do things, which is, which is interesting. In the case of coronavirus, it injects its DNA and then hijacks your cells to get it to reproduce itself within your cells, which is why it's bad. It's taking, taking over things from you. And then it's making copies of itself through without being able to do that on its own. It needs the host for that to work, which is fascinating and terrible. But um, we've learned that that's an interesting trick you can do if you wanna have, uh, it, we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we can have grown plastics or grown foam for like a car seat. We use a lot of resources to make car seats. And it would be fascinating if we could get a mold or a bacteria that would grow into more of like a structural foam 
than, than taking it all from oils and plastics. All of this feels like just a little bit bordering on the edge of magic here because it's such a complicated system that we're wrapping our heads around. Uh, but it's really amazing to see sort of what things happen in these spaces for understanding. But that said, there, that's the, okay, that was too much. Uh, let me just button that up. That was too much information in too short of a time and too many like questions about life yourself and what does this all mean? Uh, so first we're gonna stop. We're just gonna talk about one little tool, the micro pipette. It is, it is a well-loved favorite. It's one of these things. So a micro pipette is a device that lets you pick up and put down very specific amounts of fluid. If you ever played with a straw at a fast food joint where you would stick it in the cup, you'd put your finger on the top and then you'd pull up the, the liquid from your drink and then spill it on your little sister. Sorry, my little sister. Uh, perhaps you've done something that's like pipetting where you, where you pick up a small amount of liquid, you transfer it and then you dish it out somewhere else. A micro pipette does that in a very small amount and it does it in a very controlled way. And so they, we're gonna play with them a little bit later. There's basically one big button on the top and another button where you, you can pop the top of the micro pipette off. And so I'm sure Nora is gonna explain more of this later, but this is generally what we're looking at. Sometimes they have color coded buttons in labs with lots of these. So you know like what the general amount is from, from the tool. Uh, but they are all around fairly useful devices. And so there's really old school ones, even older versions of this you'd like. So this is a volumetric one where it's real skinny and then there's this wide section where you can sort of dial in the volume. Uh, and then let's see, we've got the polymerase chain reaction. So this is another thing that we're gonna do this week and in this week's particular activity, we're gonna do some polymerase chain reactions. This is a fascinating technique that we're gonna use. You're going to do a, you're gonna make copies of parts of your own DNA. And so when you do that, when you extract just one or two segments of, through a few cells worth of DNA, it's not enough to make a meaningful experience happen. You need to copy it many times. And so we have this technique that we use that really helps what DNA wants to do on its own. As long as you've got the, the four players in there, the GTACs, and then use of its RNA. If you've got those four letters floating around in solution, DNA will almost completely self-assemble. It takes another protein, a polymerase, to make that work. But you can take the DNA that you've extracted and cut up. As long as you've got little end caps that help it start, it will start to grab in all of the rest of those base pairs. And you can make copies and copies and copies of, of DNA. This is a really well-established lab technique. It takes a very small sample and it magnifies that genetic information into many, many, many copies. So what we'll be able to do is take it from being just a few samples into thousands or millions of samples. You won't need to be managing that on a time scale. And basically what it turns into is this three-step cycle of denaturing the DNA, separating the two strands of DNA, and then starting this process of putting it together and then extending it from there where like you've got this little starter primer that comes in and starts to attach and then the protein helps it finish out. So it'll do that many, many times over making copies and copies and copies. And there's some like noise DNA, but by the nature of how this copies, it copies the stuff you want much faster than the stuff that you don't care about. And so a polymerase chain reaction will just essentially work like a copy machine that just is set to go without stopping until you have a whole bunch of copies of DNA that you can look at. So we're gonna be able to take a sample from you, copy it many times, and then be able to manipulate it in a way that's visible on a macroscopic scale, which is what the gel electrophoresis is all about. We'll put that sample of DNA into a little well, and then use some electricity to draw it out so you can sort of see visually what's going on without needing to have the high fidelity of being able to read each one of those letters as you go. That's a much, trickier and more expensive lab to run. Um, but in, if you wanted to see this, here I've got this and let's hope that it's on mute. Oh, it is on mute. This is a video that was not made by me. This was made by a research group um, and my Zoom controls are blocking who made it, but it is, it was made by somebody and I think I have the name down there. But this is something that I think is best understood by looking at it, that you can take a sample, like maybe you have a bone or something, you get DNA and then you run this PCR 
and then you can make a whole bunch of copies of your target DNA. And then you can characterize maybe a, an ancient civilization or a person or something. And so the PCR is, is something that's done inside of a little machine. And so in there, you've got this thermal cycler that will heat it up and then sort of cool it back down and it manages the temperature in just a way that it, that it will go through. If you've played with the thermal, uh, thermal paste and the thermal oven for soldering, it's actually pretty similar to that. Just instead of melting metal, this is managing DNA and how it's connected. Uh, so you take your samples of the micropipette, you put them in there, then the animation that happens down in here is, is gonna be hopefully clarifying. So what happens is your target DNA exists right there. And you'll want to run it through this cycle where it, the first step is it splits apart the DNA that they've unwound it. So it's just two stripes and then it disconnects. And then it's going to cool back down after there uh, where it'll start this annealing process. You've got this polymerase that's going to help the DNA come together. These primers will get started the copy process. And then from here, you'll do some annealing. So this will grab in, you can see how it joins on these base pairs. And then it will do extending at a little bit warmer. So it's, and all of this would be available like inside the body, you know, you look at these temperatures and these are all things that can happen inside of you. But it's able to go ahead and make copies. And you can see it doesn't stop when it hits the end of the desired target. But the way that this works, you get a lot more copies of the green section than you do the red. And so you do this a number of times, the first time or maybe the second time, it doesn't help as much. But as you keep going, you can see that there's some shorter sections and you get lots and lots and lots more copies. We keep multiplying this out. This game keeps getting played and you'll eventually have many, many copies of the target DNA and only a few copies of the fragments or extras. So almost everything that you're looking at will be the target DNA through this PCR technique, which is fascinating that you can make copies of a target piece and there's some noise in that, but it's still, but it's still really useful. They're using decimals because this is a European thing and so decimals instead of commas is that's its own whole thing. But uh, in here, the polymerate up, oh, head back, I should show you. Here's the lovely people that made it. Good on them for making this animation. I really appreciate it. That was good. Uh, but then what do you do? Once you've made all these copies of DNA, we're gonna run gel electrophoresis where we run through and, and do this. So you might have seen pictures of gel electrophoresis in like a CSI sort of situation. This is really used broadly in some of those forensic game things. And, and well, even that's usually if you get a, a package lab from Flynn Science or Ward, scientific major like educational science suppliers, they'll often package it as a CSI game for gel electrophoresis so that it's fun and catchy for students. Because CSI is very popular, don't get me wrong. That's, a, that's an important part of understanding this. But you can take DNA that you've put into these little wells you see here on the left. You apply a big voltage and that voltage will drag those DNA copies through the gel. It's sort of like a mesh that it takes effort for them to get through. The smaller segments of DNA go further. The longer ones take a longer time to go through. And what you get as an end result is like a fingerprint that tells you relative proportions and, and how much of different types of DNA segments you have. So you get this little coded out, output that is very much something that you can use to better understand are two samples related? Are they identical? Are they connected? Are they not? You can start to understand things if you can read the, the code that happens in this sort of like bizarre barcode. And so it's, it's interesting. For our purposes, we're just gonna sort of see what happens um, but it, there, there are ways to do tests like this where you're, you can identify that someone have a specific gene that would make them more susceptible to, to one disease or another. Or do they have a, a, a gene that would make them uh, resistant to something? You know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you might use gel electrophoresis. We're going to do a pretty benign, like, it's just cool to see the process happen. If you want to get more, like, down into the weeds about what type of things you can test for with it, you can sure do that. But we don't want to, like, surprise anybody with genetic information you may not want to know. So um, that is that is what we're going to do this week. Next up, we've got bio leather and bioplastics. And this one I want to talk about for a little bit also. This is we're not going to do this deliberately this week, although Ogata is trying and we support those efforts. But there's 
some really cool things that can happen surrounding bioleather and bioplastics that are being done in Barcelona and in other places. But Barcelona is really doing a great job of leading this charge. Um, they have an event called Remix El Barrio, where they're trying to figure out what to do with food waste from restaurants through Barcelona. And so they're trying to come up with creative ways to use that food waste to turn into materials like leathers or sort of plastic replacements, things that can be used to make either pieces of art or garments or handbags or any sorts of things that, that could be used from those materials instead of just throwing them away, which is fascinating. There's, there's a photo out there somewhere and I would need to dig it up of an orange peel leather jacket that somebody made with a do not touch sign. I'm sure it's good uh, to wear, but you know, it's one of those show pieces that you maybe don't wear that often. Uh, in any case, there, this link that's in the slides that you should, that I'll also put in the chat is like a, a blog post, but it's a how-to guide for how to make many different versions of bio leathers. So it's not like a, they can do this and there's one photo posted and there's no instructions. They actually do a really good job of putting out information on how you'd make something like this. So there's, there's a ton of info about this particular realm. They're trying really hard in Barcelona to be as a research facility to make sustainable cities a thing where you can take the, the waste of a city and manage that just as much as you take the input so that ideally you're not shipping nearly as much in or out of a city. And I guess probably after the, the Suez fiasco that we had, it's even more reason to do such a thing. So think about how do you source uh, things locally and how do you use those materials that feel like waste locally. So there's lots of interesting things to think about in here and tons of potential. If you can have, like, imagine the value in, well, and the obvious one is biodegradable spoons. Some places have made those like mandatory for takeout. Uh, but if all of your silverware or if plastic bags would biodegrade in two years, how big of a difference that would be, right? The, there's a lot of opportunity here. And if somebody can really nail it, if somebody can make, perhaps make a perfect bacteria that grows a plastic or you make something that will biodegrade these or, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in how you can make these things work really well and put us towards a whole new future. Um, but it's, there's a lot to understand there. What's up, Wagata? Is there actually a in the I, you know, I, off the top of my head, no, but I know that it's been like a dream for a long time. I should have Googled that before we started here. Uh, I've seen reports of it being true online, but in the, you read it online, I don't really know if that's real sort of way. Not in a, not in a academic journal. Perhaps Nora knows more about that. No, doesn't exist. Yeah, the bonds and plastics are really are really aggressive. Uh, essentially, like the reason, the, chemically, the reason why plastics are so useful is because they're relatively easy to make chemically, but their bonds are so stupid strong. And for that same reason, they're also really hard to break down, um, which is which is why it's an interesting space, right? How much can life interact with that? How is there? Can we imagine some perfect mechanism that would be able to unzip them, like? It's yeah, we're we're musing about for listening at home. We're musing about maybe there is in the ocean some bacteria already that eats plastic. We just need to find it. Um, so we're you know, there's many things to think about, many ideas here. There's there's lots that could be understood, that could be better developed, that you could that you could explore. Um, and this is a space that really is just like of of the maker spaces in here i would say that like 3d printing is cool but it's now a niche that's been established for a long time the biospace is one of the newer regions and it's it's newer here but it's also a newer like maker space that has existed um there's some links that i'm gonna put point to towards the end of the slides uh but it is a space where there's really some growth potential and if you wanted to get out in front as a expert it's it's probably possible um, so those are fascinating things to take a look at. So what are some next steps? Let's say that you're interested, and I assume that we all are. Uh, I would say definitely go take a look at the Fab Lab BCN, the Barcelona Fab Labs 
blog entries to see what they're what they've been up to what progress they've made and like where this this work has been uh, also there's the global community bio summit is sort of the authoritative group that connects maker spaces with bio rooms so they would be the group jr went to their conference last back when you could go to conferences uh, and so that's a fascinating one to to look at it's a series of small groups that are doing really amazing work i know that one of their like biggest charges as a community is to think about how do we make open source insulin which seems like uh would be a huge game changer for lots of people because it's so widely needed insulin and and to be able to make it in a way that would make it almost you know very cheap or almost free would would make such a big difference in so many people's lives and then there's the thought emporium has a youtube channel that, that where i think he's made synthetic spider silk and a few other different interesting materials where you use some of these bio making things to really do some cool work there's a and there's there's many more those are just two good examples that you could take a look at um and then another thing if i if you wanted to sort of dip your toes in the best thing to do in this space is to learn is to find some like procedures to follow and just follow them there's a fair amount of complexity and so this is definitely a space where hopping in and following someone's instructions it's going to be a good way to go and there's because it's a thing that has been taught and managed by education for a long time if you can get your hands on like a a good lab example a good set of lab instructions like we're going to follow for our like prescribed thing this week it can be really helpful and really help you manage your way through steps a to b c and d so that you do all of those and you follow the instructions once you've done a few of those then there's a whole lot more once you have some context and sort of your bearings but there's a lot in this space that you need to learn because it is it's very complicated very very quickly not to say that it isn't knowable, but it, it's something that definitely people can commit entire lifetimes to understanding. And so there's a ton that's that's on here, but this week we're going to do gel electrophoresis of your own DNA, which is a really exciting lab. This is this is something that you might, if you've taken some some college bio classes, might have gotten you the ability to do this, but probably not all. And so we're excited that this is something that we can do here. We want to give you the opportunity to do here and uh we've got lovely people like nora and kyle who are absolute pros in this field and going to help us out so with that this is probably the end yeah the end of my slides we're going to follow a procedure from uc davis i'll put that link in the chat and and i'm not even close to describing this really well in detail but um with with that intro and and perhaps a uh, brief pause. Let's see what time are we at? Ooh, there's something in the chat that I could not see because of the sound thing. I'm going to stop sharing and start to transition to let Nora have some time to talk, but this is going to take some mechanical work. But as, as I fumble with the computer parts, let's go back around, say names one more time, and your favorite type of ice cream. That sounds lovely, doesn't it? All right, so uh, I'm Corey, and I'm going to go with, I had a, a lovely mud pie ice cream from the scoop girl this this week and it's real good i think it's worth the trip and uh that's my this week favorite flavor of ice cream ruby how about you uh i'm not ready you're you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah what's your favorite ice cream i i made some ice cream yesterday uh Whoa. that was that was cool I, I guess you could call it ice cream i took a bunch of frozen bananas and i put them in a food processor with a little bit of oat milk and uh some maple syrup and some walnuts with some dark chocolate chips Ooh. and uh it really hit the spot it was really it was like yeah that's good that's awesome there's an ice cream maker here there's i also have one at home and as when we consider the foundations party at the end maybe i'll bust out grandma's like too many raw eggs to be healthy ice cream recipe that we can that we can enjoy so there's there's options like that um which feels bio-ish we're we're part of bio we need ice cream <laughs> food is food is science yeah, some sort of ice cream. I think just regular ice cream counts. All right, um, so let me play with my sound and then it'll be Nora's turn.
cool. So mine is definitely a similar vein, but uh, I figure sort of a different perspective, I guess. So today we're going to do this fun little experiment in the lab, or at least start it. Um, and you really don't want me to. So uh, all of your, you're obviously made up of a lot of cells. Uh, as you might know, like basically every part of you is just different types of cells. And uh, I think Aaron, you mentioned in the comments that all of your cells have your DNA. So this is why they can like take cigarette butts and get people's DNA out of it or, or get their hair or their fingerprints. Like all of your cells have your DNA. And so one of the easiest ways to get DNA is from just like rinsing some water in your mouth and you can spit out and you've just gotten a bunch of cells and those cells all have a lot of DNA in them. So we're gonna get some from our like cheek and tongue and mouth. Um, and the uh, DNA, the term we use for like the individual little parts of DNA is called bases. And so when you think of like the double helix is what I think of DNA, the stereotypical image, all of the little lines, each one is called a base. Um, and all different groups of bases. So like different parts along the string are different genes. So like you can have gene A is in one part of the string or gene B or whatever. Um, and all of these genes tell your cells what to do. So you could have a gene that's on one part that's like hair color or blood type or height or how you look or how much you weigh. Um, and all of your cells have all of these genes. It's just some cells you're like, I cell doesn't really want to care what your hair color is. So it's, it does not, it's not using that gene, but it's all in there. It has the info. Um, and so today we're going to look at this gene called PV92. So we're all going to see what our PV92 gene looks like. Um, we specifically picked a gene that doesn't do anything at all. To, it, we all have it, but we don't know what it's there for. Um, so it doesn't have any function because when you look at your genes, you know, people do that for medicine. And if I, if I were to tell you, oh, you have some cancer gene, like I'm not a doctor, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm a scientist and I study bacteria usually. And so I can't tell you, oh, you have a cancer gene. That's, I'm not, I don't know how, there's so many things with that. So we like to look at a gene that just is gonna be, it's fun, it's cool, now you know that you, what your PV92 gene looks like, but it doesn't mean anything for your health or anything. Um, and basically, oh God, you, <laughs> <laughs> you well, honestly, your genetics, I think, I mean, don't get me started. I think one of the biggest disappointments, your genetics don't really determine that much about your health. Like much more, what's much more important is like the lifestyle you live. I mean, we thought we would cure all the cancers once we knew what people's DNA was. And then it turned out like smoking and UV and the food you eat is just like, oh, it's that's the thing that gives you cancer. It's not, for most people, it's not. Yeah, it's like, but there's still some cool stuff. You, you can know what your hair color is. There's other ways to know what your hair color is, which is looking at your hair. Uh, so genetics, I don't know. I love genetics, but I wouldn't say it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about this gene is that everybody either has a small version of this gene or a big version. So I said that DNA, all the little bits and pieces of it are called bases. And so we, that's how we measure how big a gene is. And so you either have a, a 641 base PV92 or a 941 base PV92. Um, so we're gonna see. Exactly those numbers? Yeah, like we're gonna see how big your gene is. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> not, I, <laughs> it's not, you know, super informative, but it's kind of cool. It's a protein squad. There are like a lot of that don't do anything like this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, most of your DNA doesn't do any. That's why we, you can have 60% the same as a banana and function. You're not the same as a banana, you know, but we just have all this stuff in there that's probably like a remnant of like when we were like amoebas in the ocean. And I don't know, you know, like we know, yeah, they're just like hung around. And, Aaron asked a question. Oh, yeah. That, um, that kind of relates to this. Yeah. He's saying like if the PV92 gene doesn't do anything, but we happen to have that in common with the jellyfish. Maybe do something for the jellyfish or the banana or the cat. Oh, yeah. Like, do we know anything about it? It could, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's some things that, like, both cells do. Like, you're still going to need to oxidize sugar. So, you're still going to need to go through cellular restriction in some form. There are a lot of different organisms. So, for some, you know, some things that are good, they're still useful. But then there's lots of 
yeah yeah because we did all like basically everything that's alive came like back way back when they we all evolved from like amoebas so, i mean they probably weren't amoeba back then but so we all sort of kind of do similar things which is we all live and have dna and so there is like a lot of common stuff that yeah like you're saying we're just, we need to like have energy and reproduce and I mean, I guess we don't have to do that. But. So there's there's functions <laughs> of DNA that we have in common with other critters that have DNA. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, like obviously us and like a D are both of eyes. So like we might have like the same eye gene, mm -hmm. but there's even more like, yeah, we both need to like have Golgi apparatus and whatever. So, yeah. So would it be that like we, we we would have different genes for our respective eyeballs, right? And those genes would be multiple bases each, right? And would what they have in common be like a percentage of all the bases that go into that gene? Or is it really like a function of genes in, in total and what percentage we have in common? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's both things. It's both like, oh, you, you maybe have a gene that like helps make your like, pupil or something and it also is going to have like a very similar pupil gene it's maybe like a little different because your pupils are not yeah but you also it also might have one that's like oh i'm a squid and i can see more colors than people and so i'm going to like just have these totally crazy genes that, and the bases are just all different yeah okay thank you yeah yeah i know that's a great question um but yes, I don't know actually if other animals have PV92. They might, although since it's since it's useless, I'm kind of like, why does anybody have it? But uh, yeah, so basically, you either have we can either have this kind of big one or this kind of small one, and then um, but actually, you since so like my DNA, I have you probably heard you get some DNA from your mom, and some DNA from your dad, and so we all end up with like kind of half and half, we, or we have both. Um, and so we have two copies of every gene. And so you could actually be, your PV92 could be both, you could have a big and a small one if you got like a, two different ones from your two different parents, or you could have, both your parents could have big PV92. And so you could have two big copies, or you could have gotten small copies from your parents. So what we're gonna see is sort of like, what is your genotype, which is like, what set of genes do you have? And it's one, it's, we're all gonna be one of these three, unless we like totally mess up the experiment, which will be maybe nothing, <laughs> yes. But um, yeah, so it'll be one of these three. And um, we had sort of talked about, well, how are we gonna actually know this? And um, genes are too small to see on the microscope. So this is DNA. And I don't know, this is what it looks like under the microscope, but I don't know. You can kind of see that it looks like that double helix. <laughs> you know, it's like kind of jaggedy. It's like you could maybe be like a little thing. And so this is when somebody tried to look at it under a microscope and it's 20 nanometers, it's that little bar. And one hair is 100,000 nanometers. So it's like, it's just too tiny. It's inconceivably tiny for us to look at a gene under a microscope. So we have to do something else, which is first we, we're gonna get our DNA out of our mouth and then we're gonna take we're just not gonna have that much dna and we only care about pv92 so we're just we're gonna do the pcr like we talked about we're gonna make a million trillions trillions of copies of just pv92 um and then we're gonna sort it by size which is how we can we'll be able to tell if you have a big one or a small one um yeah when you're talking about that target dna like how do you say <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, I think this is my next one. And this is <laughs> a very big explanation of what, what's happening here. But basically, we're going to give it an enzyme that's for PV92 gene. It's going to be this enzyme that we, the, the company has custom sort of made with all of the bits and pieces that it tell this tiny little molecule, like, we only want PV92 and nothing else. And it's going to go and like, make a million copies of that. So tonight, after we get out our DNA, I'll give you this stuff, which has this, this like enzyme in it, and you'll mix it with your DNA. And then we'll get a bunch of copies, the whole process, that like thermal cycler thing that like changes temperatures, it's like a little oven that takes four hours to do. 
that enzyme's got to like, you know, it's got to do its business. It takes a little time. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's kind of crazy. You can literally, like, we figured out how you basically, this enzyme will copy any DNA you want. But if you give it like a little tiny piece of PV92, it like tells it, it it just knows like molecularly when you give it a little piece, it's like, oh, that's what I gotta go search and copy. So like, um, it'll be like, oh, I guess you can't, <laughs> not everyone can see if I get up there and poke the thing, but it'll like the, the bases that are in PV92 are pretty like, that's the only piece, that's the only place you can find those bases. And so, when we give the enzyme like all those bases, it's like, oh, you want me to go find this and make a million copies. It just like knows that's yeah. 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 Yeah, there's really they basically when they figured this out there's this one enzyme it's called like a polymerase and it we have it in our own cells because we need to make copies of our dna when we like like every whenever you get new skin like every couple weeks your skin replaces itself and so you need to make new cells and you need to make new dna and so we actually have this enzyme we don't use it it just like makes it will go on your your whole dna it will just be like oh i you just need you know, your cells are getting old, like crusty. I don't want them anymore. We need new cells, we need new DNA. I'm gonna make a copy of it. So then we figured that out and we like tweaked it a little bit and realized we could just like be like, okay, just make a copy of this piece. But I don't know if that was answers your question, but yeah, there are there are enzymes that do all sorts of weird stuff with DNA. Yeah. Yeah, like we didn't, I mean, almost everything I do in the lab is like science, like nature is a better inventor of these like crazy things than we are. And like, yeah, so this molecule existed. We did like have to do a little things to make it do this. Um, but yeah, it's basically out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, so then the enzyme will do it. Well, it'll know PV92, it'll go make these millions of copies. Um, and then this is my very rudimentary drawing of what happens next, which is the, it's called gel electrophoresis and it's how we're gonna sort the DNA by size. So basically you take, we're gonna take either your big piece of, D, of PV92 or your small piece of PV92 and put it into this gelatin. It's like, it's called agar. We actually use it in food stuff too. So. You, I would not eat this stuff we have from lab, but uh, it's great because it actually like, uh, it forms this like little matrix that's molecular. And so we put our DNA in and it turns out that DNA for whatever reason is negatively charged. And so if you run a current through the jelly, the, the DNA will get pulled towards the positive side. Um, and so it'll move through this jelly, like kind of slowly like wiggling its way through towards the positive current, but the bigger pieces just get like kind of stuck on the jelly. And so they don't move as quickly. And this is how they figured out how to like sort things by size kind of, because then the small piece kind of like moves towards the positive anode or cathode or whatever, uh, faster than the big piece. Um, and so then in the end, we kind of looked at these, you guys will see it better in, in there, but basically you can see how, uh, different sizes of stuff is like how many base pairs it is long and so we're either going to have that like 600 or 900 piece and we can compare it to the on the farthest left that like sort of column of bands is just like a marker that tells you how big of the piece it is that you're looking at but then we'll, we'll have it'll tell us like oh it won't just be these random bits of dna floating around and be like oh you have the 600 piece and you have the 900 pv92 yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, so basically, <laughs> it, 
and then in summary, we will sort of know we can, we've gone from getting our own DNA and then to knowing exactly like what this little piece of DNA is inside of us. It's just really cool. Um, hmm. Um, it's a hundred volts. I don't know if that's all. I don't have a metric. That's like how much is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But the the oh, we're gonna put in about a hundred volts, I think, is what the machine is for, and that that's a pretty high voltage. It's close to wall voltage, but it has to be DC because it needs to be electrostatically pulling it through. It's the some of the ions on the ends, some of the ends of DNA sugars are charged, and so that negative charge is where they can get and pull. You can pull the DNA through because of those charges that are built up. 100 volts is enough that it moves across, but it's sort of a balance. You could hit it with 400 volts if you wanted, but then it would move across the gel too quickly. You risk like tearing things molecularly, not like on a real scale, but um, you, you don't want to go too low of a voltage because then it would be too slow of a drag. The like voltage that you pick helps set the rate of it going and you have to stop it before you hit an end. Like you don't want to let it you don't want it to go so fast that it hits the end before you stop it. And you don't want it to take for forever. So hitting that hundred volts is sort of a balance of how charged is the DNA versus how much supply can we give it? Uh, DC can be any voltage you want. A hundred volts DC is a pretty rare circuit size. Um, like 110 is AC is what you get out of the wall. To turn that into a DC voltage means that all of the electric force is always headed in one direction. If you instead hooked it up to AC, instead of moving in one direction, they'd be sort of pushed back and forth through the gel, which wouldn't move them anywhere. We want one directional motion the whole time in the gel. So that's what that part is about. Uh, so yeah, and then there's there's other fun stuff you can do besides look at your DNA. I really like microscopy because there's like all these weird things out there you can look at, like weird amoebas. I don't know, it's not like maybe the most like clinically relevant thing you could do, but if I love to like just get, if you get water that's left over from like, if you have flowers and then the water gets kind of weird looking after a week, there, it's like all these little, there's this like whole little ecosystem happening in there. So sometimes in grad school, I would just like take some of that and look at it under the microscope and be like, ah, ha, I'm the <laughs> lording over my flower whatevers. Um, we also, you talked about the engineering bacteria, which is something um, I've done a little bit of science with. You can make bacteria that glow in the dark. You can also make bacteria that can like sense poisons in the water or bacteria that like, and we try to make bacteria that make plastics. Um, so there's a lot of potential there. Uh, also, the, we talk about biomaterials, some really cool stuff. We're also working on a lab to do water testing. Um, I don't know if we have all the stuff yet, but that would be pretty cool. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any other ideas of things they want to test out or projects, I'm, I'm around. So. Yeah, there's so many crazy things to like think about and do but when you consider the science of it the like just learning all the techniques of a space like this is really exciting in and of itself like to do these things to look under a microscope and see the little swimmies moving around is really cool and like that's totally worth doing even if you don't really know what they are it's worth just looking at for the sake of there's a whole other scale that life exists at um, but the, the things that you can make in a bio lab are fascinating and they're very complex. You can go the full range of like, make some plastic from an old orange to all the way, like I'm inventing a new bacteria that will solve some problem in the world. So there's a ton of range that's available. They're not all equally easy. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of complexity in this space. Um, but it's also a fascinating one that has the ability to change lives in ways that we, like, we can't even wrap our heads around yet. Um, so there's, there's a ton of really cool stuff.
that can be done in in this space. And so I really look forward to seeing something wild come, come out of there. But yeah, uh, yeah. Any other questions, Doss? Before we're gonna do show and tell briefly, and then we're gonna get to get to doing. Questions? No. Okay. Uh, let's do show and tell then. And Nora, if you would stop presenting, we'll just do show and tell, and I'll turn my yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> and we're. I'm going to let's see. Make some changes on my system, but we're good here. Okay. So let's see. Aaron, can you hear us? Oh, you're muted. Yep, I'm, yep. I can hear okay, you just great. fine. Cool. Um, so we're going to do show and tell, and we can do anybody who wants to can can go for it. There's there's tons of options. Interfaces was definitely a more open-ended week. So hopefully you had something fun and interesting that you did that maybe was interface related. Maybe it wasn't. This is not a place of judgment in any way. So we're just happy to hear, like, what have you been up to for the past week? Um, and if anyone would like to go first, you sure can, or I can I can pull up this one thing that I got that I was working on. Yeah, let's go for it, Kate. So I was thinking, I don't know if, if Aaron is, is there and can see, um, I can try to bring it with us, but basically I had this plan where I was going to look at the Make Haven website in terms of user interfaces, because we recognize that most things take way more than three clicks and there's a lot of stuff that we wanted to work with there. And then I saw this YouTube video and I'm going to have to go back to user interface because I saw this YouTube video and I wanted to try a thing um, and it was really fun. So I ended up checking out uh, combining the laser cutter CNC and the water jet CNC and I used the laser cutter to create um, a border on the outside and then use the water jet to cut glass to try to make some CNC stained glass. Of course, I used it in glass. You all knew that was coming. Um, so if people who are here want to come over to the light table, I can show you what I mean, because it's not assembled yet, but you can see. Take me with you. Because that was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, Ooh. it's a field trip. This is great. I, I don't know if anyone, if I may just need to send Aaron a picture. I can uh, see it. Yeah, I don't think you can hear me. This is what I mean. Let's see if Aaron can see. Oh, Aaron can see, maybe. So there you go. I think Aaron can see. Um, so that's wow. actually what you're looking at is cardstock. Uh, I mean, like matte board, because I had some trouble with the acrylic. So that's just sort of a template. But then all of these, they're not attached or anything. All of these are the glass pieces. And I cut those in um, on the water jet. So I just designed this in Inkscape and then cut all the pieces out individually. And then this is just the frame and I'm gonna attach them together. So you'll see a final project later, but that's, that's where that was. And it was really fun. All right, so um, just, just so that you don't have to go immediately after Kate, Here's what I've been working on. Here we go. This, here's the setup. You'll be able to see it there, but I'll turn it back over here. Making sure that it gets into the recording. But this is a strip of LEDs. If I pull this off, I, this has all been CNC'd. This is then a laser cut mat board and paper. That's just paper that it's going through. Those are all glued. They're just the tape backing. And then I figured out what the numbers of the LEDs themselves were. Now this is like a point where I can do some animating for how current flows through this circuit so that I can show how that works. And with paper here, it seems sort of dumb, but it's a lot cheaper than acrylic. And if I line it up right at about a, a half an inch away, it's a nice diffuser where you can still see what's glowing, but it doesn't look like discrete LEDs anymore. So I've got over in the other in the electronics area, I've got some origami that I designed to be like half inch standoff. So that it's all paper. It's nice and easy to make. It's cheap. It's you know it's kind of meditative to hold, but then it'll hold that mat board off about a half an inch. And so then I've got to do, I was hoping to get to, but didn't. This is my interface panel. And so I need like a big toggle for it has a resistor, doesn't have a resistor, and a button for what happens when you press the button. So like pressing the button here would press or unpress the button there. 
And so you can start to imagine what happens to the current flowing in the circuit, like as you're doing your thing. That's the goal. Um, this is taken months. I started this, I looked at my last like timestamp on this thing. It was like early March. So this is actually the month ago today. So this is a long, slow process of getting there. Um, but in time, it's, you know, we're making our way. But it takes, it takes a lot of effort to get to something like this. And all I did this week was just like finish my, my um, start, start working out the code and how do I do this animation stuff. That's really all I did. But that is, right, yeah. Oh, you can, you can do it. You made a cool thing. Hello. Um, I'm going to share my screen. This week I made, surprise, another lamp. Um, I worked with Corey to use an Arduino Teensy to program a lamp so that it turns on at a, the exact same time every night and it'll stay on for five hours and then just turn off. And I wanted this lamp, um, originally it was going to be a light sensor like that will detect when it when when night falls or whatever or like a sound like activated lamp but um i think this works better because it takes less thinking for me in the moment like to clap or to like i don't know i guess the light isn't that doesn't really connect to what i'm saying but um i want a smart home but i don't want it smart i just want it to do it you know um, if that makes any sense. So here is my lamp. Um, I bought it at a thrift, at a thrift store. Um, and I don't think you can see it here, but I have a video here. Um, I'll lower this. And like, so there's two different, um, it, there's a split in the, in the, in the cord, I guess. Um, and I have a diagram here that I can show you. Um, so there's the plug and it connects to five volts of power, right? And um, so it's split into uh, the trinket. Am I saying this right? Um, and the trinket is connected to uh, the relay that turns it on and off. Um, and basically, uh, it, it was it was great I this is something actually we've been working on for weeks um, and like I, I finally feel like I can make something else like this on my own um, so I'm gonna do that with another lamp that I got from the thrift store um, and I'm so excited that I don't have to remember to turn off my lamp at night when I go to sleep um, because that's a lot of work so that's it that's, that's it but does anybody else want to come on up and present for show and tell or present for that I started with um, is for the van and that's my bed. So my whole electric system is running through in this direction towards my car battery. And I needed to design around that switch and the wires. And the first, design I thought oh I want to see the wires and get to them easily I don't want them behind you know the cabinet because then it'll be harder to get to then I realized you know whenever I need to service the heater which will probably be a few times a year or take out the cabinet in an emergency spill or whatever uh, it I'm not gonna be able to I'm gonna have to unplug my entire electric system so that's the designing um, So yeah, here, here's the finished piece. I basically just took it out, cut um, holes on the bottom, ran it through. And then also the cabinet, which was um, bolted in, uh, it made it impossible to remove the cabinet or service the, the heater. So I put a hinge on it and now it's done. And the hole in there I am currently using to just um, prop up the ducting for the heater. So that's it. And then uh, I'm also uh, one is personal and political, but I'm really proud of it. 
uh, I'm in a lawsuit to add non-binary to the New York language. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Then let's see. We've got Lila, Eliana, and we'll got to. Okay. Sure. No, no problem. Oh, yeah. Lila taught a tough thing class, so that's that's worth just like a little yeah, way to way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh I I I do want to see a video, but maybe maybe not this moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. And then Ileana Wagata, either you have things you want to share or just like it, it's just been a busy time. So a few weeks ago, I worked on bioplastics. Um, I think it was tapioca starch. And then also like a hemp seed and like, uh, like guar gum, I think base is, is like that's a guar gum. Uh, so uh, the tapioca starch one, uh, it was like vinegar. Uh, what else? Maybe like a tablespoon of tapioca starch. Uh, what else? Like distilled water. Uh, I cooked that for probably like about five minutes until it got like to thick gel. Uh, I, I put it over uh, wax paper. I let it dry for a few days and uh, it was pretty strong. What I was hoping to do was to take two uh, dishes, put it between there and maybe uh, it's like these, these two rectangular containers and maybe it could mold to that, but it was pretty thin. And once uh, the humidity went up in, in the apartment, then the integrity of the plastic would drop like quite a bit. So I'd like to make that stronger uh, next time I build that. I also used uh, hemp seed and, and uh, uh, guar gum. So pretty much vinegar, all the same ingredients. Uh, it was pretty, it, it was pretty crumbly uh, when it came out, it was almost like uh, it's like a, just a stuck, a thick, like oatmeal paste type consistency. It was pretty clumpy as well. I'm not sure what I could do to get that stronger, but I'd be interested in playing with that a little more. I think maybe like some, kind of like with the uh, like composites, maybe fiber. Maybe I can get some fibrous material in there uh, to get it uh, a little more I guess holding together uh, after after I'm done uh, making that. So if I have some time this week, I, I'll probably play around with it a little more. We'll see. Good job. All right, Eliana, do you have anything you want to share? Okay, I'll I can pull up the Slack link and. Here we go. And then I can, you know what I realized as you were recording, Kate, is I should have shared my screen for the last one, except for one of them. Hit share and then. Um, so this is potentially, potentially dot, 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 not sure yet. Um, my make something big project. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to um, do something biochemical with the paints so that they glow at night on their own without, um, like, so there's specific paints you can buy that glow in the dark and there are other paints that you shine a black light on them and they light up. But what I want is to have like a bioluminescent glow when the lights are off on this window. So to fully explain, I got I'm going to be participating in the window art project that's happening in May all around New Haven. And this is the window that I was given. I would not have picked such a complicated window, but um, so this is my design. And the reason the colors are so bright is because the idea is that I'm trying to use pigments that will reflect the bioluminescence at night. I'm not so sure how it's going to work. I have to run a couple of tests. Um, but if it works, then even if the lights are off in the store and the street lights aren't very bright, it'll have like this 
cool kind of internal glow to it. Um, but it's all like conjecture at this point. But that's my my plan. That sounds that would be awesome. If you got that to work. That's really cool. And that's the mock-up. Yeah, that's the mock-up. That's lovely. I I love the like. It's like a little fort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mock-up. Yeah, the snake is is adorable. All right, so we did our show and tell, and so what we're what we're gonna do is sadly probably leave leave Aaron at this point. Sorry for the. Okay. Yep, <laughs> but um. <laughs> But the, the main thing that we're going to do is try and get everybody started on this biolab stuff. This is real exciting. We're all here. Uh, we, can, we can go ahead and get started. So um, without any further ado, go for it. <laughs>